So before I begin my presentation, I just want to say that on a personal note, incidentally, one of the most momentous occasions that took place during my term as PPA president in 2017 was the passage of our mental health law, both at the Congress and the Senate levels. I vividly remember having spent a significant chunk of my time that entire year attending stakeholder meetings, making courtesy calls to senators and congressmen who authored our bill, being present in bicameral meetings. And um, this photo I'm showing you right now was actually taken in one of those hearings, of course, with our beloved colleague and friend, Dr. June Lopez, who herself was a staunch supporter and worker for the bill, as well as Senator Risa Ontiveros, who is our principal sponsor in the Senate. So it was such a victorious and celebratory period, not just for us psychiatrists, but for the entire mental health field in general. Because the truth is that our mental health law is really the product and culmination of the efforts of many minds and hearts, which spanned for almost three decades. So having said that, my specific task for tonight is simply to be able to set the tone for our two other main presenters, Dr. Tolentino and Dr. Ignacio, who will be touching on the impact and implications of our mental health law on our current practice as psychiatrists, as well as re reorienting and reframing mental health within the context of our contemporary times. And I will be doing that by giving a brief presentation on the historical perspective of our mental health law. So as a quick backgrounder, the rationale for a mental health legislation is essentially for the protection of the rights and dignity of persons with mental health disorders as well as for the development of accessible and effective mental health services. It is considered as an essential part and critical factor in the overall mental health program of any given country, which can either impede or facilitate the development of a country's mental health services. Globally thus far, there has been a wide variation in the existing mental health legislations of the developed or Western countries, whereas for the developing countries, which are mostly South Asian, most of them have adopted the legislative structure of the developed countries, with some modifications according to their individual social cultural trends, economic background, and national priority. Now, because the WHO found that only 68% of the Commonwealth countries had a mental health policy, it set a target as its mental health action plan that at least 80% of countries should have developed or updated their mental health policies and plans by 2020. And such policies should be in line with the international and regional human rights instrument. So this was cited by the former World Psychiatric Association president, Dr. Dinesh Bugra, in an article that he authored in 2018 in World Psychiatry, which is the official journal of the WPA. Um, it was actually an article that reviewed the existing mental health policies globally. And in that article, Dr. Bugra and his co-author shared their main findings, which were that 21% of the countries still did not have a mental health policy. On top of that, an additional 30%, although they found references in various documents to such a policy, they were unable to find a men formal mental health policy in place. And meanwhile, among those countries that do have a mental health policy, only 28% had started to formally adopt and implement it. Only 16% had a clear statement on how funding would be used for financing mental health services. And only 20% explicitly stated that mental health should be included in health insurance. So in the end, while the WHO reported that 68% of countries globally had their respective mental health policies, Pugra and his co-authors were able to find such a policy in only 48%. So 
One of the most important things we need to highlight about the historical background of our Philippine mental health law is that its journey began as far back as in the late 80s, actually 33 years ago to be exact, which was the time when the very first Mental Health Act was filed by then Senator Orlando Mercado in 1989 which highlighted the creation of a board of mental health under the Department of Health, as well as the inclusion of psychiatric illnesses under the coverage of the Medicare. It was then followed by another version a year later called the Mental Health Act of 1990, otherwise known as the Senate Bill 295, which was filed by Senator Jose Lina, this time highlighting the creation of a national coordinating body headed by the Secretary of Health with members composing of the Undersecretaries of Education, Justice, Labor and Employment, and Social Welfare, as well as presidents of the Philippine Mental Health Association, the Philippine Mental Medical Association, plus two other members from the private sector. So there was a bit of a lag after that, and eight years later, in the year 1998, then-President Fidel V. Ramos rolled out Executive Order 470, which mandated the creation of the Philippine Council for Mental Health, which will also serve as the policy-making and advisory body on all government programs on mental health, chaired by the Secretary of Health and composed of the following members. So we have secretaries of the different departments, such as the DSWD, DOLE, DILG, Education, Culture and Sports, and Justice. We also have the chief of NCMH, the chairman of the Department of Psychiatry of UPPGH and SHED, the director general of TESTA, as well as three representatives from NGOs oriented towards mental health. Another long lag of 11 years, in 2009, the Senate Bill number 3509 was introduced and filed by then Senate President Juan Ponce Enrile, which was an act providing for a national mental health care delivery system, aiming to promote the institutionalization or shifting from a hospital-based to a community-based mental health care delivery system, modernizing the existing mental health facilities at that time, as well as integrating mental health care in the general health care delivery system, among others. In the same year, a similar bill was filed in Congress by House Speaker Prospero Nograles and South Cotabato Representative Arthur Pingoy Jr., also pushing for the provision of a national mental health care delivery system, as well as the establishment of the Philippine Council for Mental Health, referred to as House Bill 6679. And then there was another bill shortly thereafter in 2010, introduced by representatives Rufus Rodriguez and Maximo Rodriguez Jr., referred to as the National Mental Health Act of 2010, otherwise known as House Bill Number 3390. And in fact, a few other bills still after that. Um, such as the House Bill 2450 by Senator Lauren Lagarda in 2014. We also have the House Bill 5347 or the Philippine Mental Health Act of 2015, authored by Vice President Lenny Robredo and Representatives Ibarra Gutierrez and Walden Bello in 2015, which on the same year was also introduced by Senator Pia Cayetano in the upper chamber as Senate Bill 2910. So fundamentally, the basic essence that has been consistently expressed in all of these Senate and House bills was the provision of a national mental health care delivery system, the establishment of the Philippine Council for Mental Health, and the appropriation for the necessary funds for such endeavors. And basically, all of these bills have highlighted the following components give or take a few modifications, such as the promotion of deinstitutionalization, the modernization of the existing mental health facilities, the integration of mental health in the general 
health delivery system, the prevention and treatment of mental illness through nationwide multi-sectoral and collaborative efforts, the access to a comprehensive health care and treatment system, the identification of vulnerable groups such as children and adolescents, the elderly, overseas Filipino workers, survivors of extreme life experiences such as violence and other such circumstances, and last but not the least, the promotion of mental health through a multidisciplinary approach encompassing education, labor and employment, social welfare and justice. So together with all of these bills that I have mentioned though, there were attempts along the way toward the development of mental health policies and plans, one of the earliest of which is the Administrative Order Number 8, as instituted by the Department of Health in 2001, because the WHO that year declared a global crisis in mental health, and therefore, 2001 has been largely dedicated towards enjoining all sectors and working towards mental health. Specifically, the core issues that they declared needed attending to at that time were first the lack of awareness of mental health as an integral component of the general healthcare system and second they also acknowledged the lack of political will to implement a comprehensive national mental health program as reflected by all of the filed mental health bills just falling by the wayside so basically the end game for them at that time was the formulation of a national mental health policy by the DOH. So this was also another AO by the DOH in 2016, which was the administrative order number 0039, which is the revised operational framework for a comprehensive national mental health program. So this is just to provide you a snapshot of the chronology of all of the events that I have mentioned, right from the birthing of the very first Mental Health Act in 1989, all the way to the passage of RA 11036 in 2017. And before I end, I also just want to highlight that um, before the final passage of the Congress and Senate bills in 2017, there were actually several small technical working group meetings that took place, and more importantly, two major Healthy Mind summits in 2008 and 2014. In fact, it was the proceedings of the first Healthy Mind Summit in 2008, which led to the creation and filing of House Bill 6679, which was sponsored by Speaker Nograles, and Representative Pingoy in 2009, which I also mentioned previously. On the other hand, the Healthy Mind Summit 2 led to the Manila Declaration of Support for our Mental Health Bill, the creation of the first draft of the Civil Society Organization's version of the bill, as well as the formal launch of, um, of our MH Act Now ad campaign. So if you remember, we had a lot of activities nationwide in relation to our MH Act campaign, beginning in 2014 during the term of Dr. Ed Tolentino, then following through by um, Dr. Carubin in 2015, Dr. Flores in 2015, and finally the passing of the bill in the Senate and Congress during my term in 2017. And I also want to say that it's actually all of these that really makes our mental health law special and distinct because it is essentially and largely authored, not just by lawmakers, but by the most important stakeholders. So it's really the outcome of consultations and even drafting by the various public and private stakeholders. So, of course, aside from the PPA and DOH, which initiated the efforts, there's also the Philippine Neurological Association, the Psychological Association of the Philippines, the Philippine Mental Health Association, the Philippine League Against Epilepsy, the Philippine Guidance and Counseling Association, the WHO, the Commission on Human Rights, and we also had representatives from the media, various youth groups, civil society organizations, other mental health institutions, and of course, last, last but certainly not least, our patients themselves, as well as their family members. So it really took a massive and broad um, cons consultative effort involving a democratic, transparent, and inclusive process 
actually necessitating 32 drafts before arriving at a final version. Of course, in the end, um, all of these exertions came into fruition when ultimately on May 2, 2017, the Senate version of our bill was passed. And a few months later, on November 20, 2017, followed the passage of the House bill version. And lastly, on June 21, 2018, it was formally signed into a law by former President Rodrigo Roa Duterte. Thank you for your attention. Good evening, dear colleagues and friends. Tonight, I'd like to thank the PPA board uh, for allowing us to have this talk. And I was assigned to talk about the primer on the mental health law. And I'd like to focus on its usefulness in our clinics. So the objective of my talk is to discuss the more salient provisions of Republic Act 11036 or the Mental Health Act that are relevant for the clinician. And I chose a few case vignettes to illustrate how it becomes relevant in our practice. Allow me to do a deep dive and start with patient A. Patient A refuses initially treatment in the emergency department when he was approached by the ER doctor. But strangely, later he agrees after being asked to do so by a calm, middle-aged, bearded male psych resident. When the patient is later asked why he changed his mind, he responds, our father, Jesus, which was in reference to the psych resident, had asked him to do so. In this case, did the patient actually give an informed consent to treatment? Let's review the provisions. In terms of informed consent, it should be voluntarily given by a service user to the attending mental health service provider. In this informed consent, we should talk about the plan for treatment, including the nature, the consequences, the benefits, as well as the risks. After a full disclosure, which is communicated not in scientific technical language, but in plain language by the attending mental health service provider, it's also important that we mention the other available alternatives to the service user. In fact, a person has the right to give informed consent upon evidence of the following. There should be a capacity to communicate a choice regarding treatment, an understanding of information and recommendations presented by the clinician, an acknowledgement of one's medical or psychiatric illness and the consequences of treatment options and of course the ability to engage and rationally process information in more simple terms these concepts can be shortened to intelligently able to process information the patient or service user knowingly also meaning understands the risks, the benefits, and alternatives related to the situation, and voluntarily, meaning free from any coercion, uh, be able to make a proper decision. In the case of patient A, although this patient knowingly understood what it meant to be treated, he did not intelligently make the decision because he was operating under a delusion that directly influenced his actions and the processing of the situation. It is generally assumed that an individual has capacity. However, if he behaves in a manner to suggest otherwise, such as referring to the psych resident as Jesus, 
the capacity needs to be examined even if the patient agrees with the treatment. Let's move to patient B to further elucidate decision-making capacity. So patient B, in contrast to uh, patient A, has paranoid delusions about the NBI, but he does not believe that the Bureau is in any way involved in his current treatment. So in this case, this patient B possess decision-making capacity. In this case of patient B, he may be suffering from delusions, but still he maintains his capacity to make a decision because and as long as the delusion does not affect the specific task at hand. The capacity to consent besides being task specific is also moment specific, which is in part why many consider there to be a sliding scale for the assessment of capacity. Decisions that could have greater repercussions in uh, the example of having possible loss of life, the restriction of li liberties generally would require a level of an, a higher or greater level of understanding. Example also, a lower level to be exam is like being examined by a stethoscope versus a higher level, which is to sign in to be confined in a hospital. A similar sliding scale of capacity may also occur in emergent situations where time and safety concerns are often critical and play into the risk benefit assessment. This comes from uh, the journal uh, uh, by John Paul uh, Shand uh, in the Psychiatric Times uh, online article. And it suggests to us the possible information to include when we're documenting the determining capacity. And I go, uh, these are how the diagnosis was determined. So we note down the behavior, the exact statements made verbatim, I usually do that. And if any collateral uh, information was given. Uh, we have to know the severity of the illness. We need to have evidence-based medicines uh, reference if appropriate, the knowledge of expressed wishes, uh, and this could be based on what the patient actually stated during the interview, or ideally, and we'll talk about this in a bit, advanced directives. Uh, we could also base it on past and tr uh, present treatment plans. Uh, we need to note down the alternatives that were considered and factored in and given in terms of information to the patient, if there are also specific factors that suggest the lack of capacity with examples, if appropriate, just like patient A. Prognosis or severity of the situation, like for example, uh, uh, there was fighting with the staff, second opinions or consults obtained or requested, uh, which helps. Uh, when we consult colleagues, uh, fellow psychiatrists, or mental health professionals. The concerns raised by others, including the family or the treatment uh, team, prior experience with the individual, if applicable, and if there's any escalating behavioral concerns or threats. It's very important that past this situation or the post-intervention, we continue to do assessments and go into uh, follow-up. And during this time, some of the issues that we can again bring up with a patient include the reasons for the intervention to demonstrate the consistency of the wishes of our service user, their continued awareness, or the opposite, the lack of awareness of the situation. 
We also need to note down uh, and talk about the risk and benefits of the interventions given to show even, either if they retain the information or they did not and their ability to manipulate the information given. Continued assessment to see also if the patient has maintained or regained already the capacity after the emergent uh, treatment, example, uh, giving IM injections uh, during an acute uh, agitation to make informed decisions also about additional or be able to discuss this for future treatment. So just points to ponder before we leave this topic, capacity is not static in the sense that it is moment specific and task specific and at times is considered on a sliding scale. Often, as I mentioned in the last slide, the judgment of two physicians might be needed to determine the lack of capacity and the need for a surrogate decision unless there is an emergency exception. Example, there is concern for imminent harm to self or others. There are indeed certain exceptions to informed consent. Treatment, restraint, or confinement, whether physical or chemical, may be administered or implemented in these following situations. First, during psychiatric or neurologic emergencies. Next, when there is impairment or temporary loss of decision-making capacity on the part of a service user. It should be pursuant to the following safeguards and conditions, including it should be in compliance with the service user's advanced directives. And you'll hear this more often in the course of this lecture because it's something that we certainly would like to encourage all mental health professionals to do with their uh, service users. And if av available, unless doing so would pose an immediate risk of serious harm to the patient or another person. Now, it should be only to the extent that such treatment or restraint is necessary and only while a psychiatric or neurologic emergency or impairment or temporary loss of capacity exists or persists. Upon the order of the service users attending mental health professionals, as reviewed by the Internal Review Board of the Mental Health Facility, where the patient is being treated within 15 days from the date such order was issued. Um, there are updates on the Internal Review Board. Um, and uh, the currently, the um, Council for Mental, Philippine Council for Mental Health has decided for now um, to postpone its implementation owing to the fact that there are too few uh, people from both the Department of Health and the uh, Commission on Human Rights to man these uh, IRBs in all the hospitals uh, in our country. The involuntary treatment or restraint shall be in strict accordance with guidelines containing clear criteria on the application as well as the termination of such medical intervention. Very important to fully document this and subject it to regular external independent monitoring, review, and audit by the Internal Review Board when it finally is implemented. There are instances where the service user may have failed to appoint a legal representative for so many circumstances. So let's go to patient C. Now patient C is an elderly man who looked frail and almost emaciated. He was seen by witnesses wandering the street seemingly lost. He entered a Sari Sari store asking for bread uh, when he suddenly 
lost consciousness. He was rushed to the ER of a public hospital with no next of kin. Tests and treatments have to be done to determine the cause of the loss of consciousness. However, patient seems disoriented upon waking up. When asked if he had any relatives who can be reached, he just looked back quite perplexed. So in this situation, if the service user's advance directive, if he had any, does not show any such preference, we may assist our, this service user by in providing uh, decisions or making decisions based on their base, uh, best interest. And it is based on the following. First, the degree and potential benefit of treatment. Second, impairments that may result from the treatment. And third, the quality of life as experienced uh, by service users. We have to determine if there is a temporary loss of decision-making capacity. And uh, this term is defined as a medically determined inability on the part of a service user or any other person affected by a mental health condition to provide informed consent. So I highlighted that it is medically determined, not legally or otherwise. In this impairment or temporary loss of decision-making capacity, a service user has impairment or temporary loss of decision-making capacity when the service user, as assessed by a mental health professional, is unable to understand the information concerning the nature of a mental health condition, or understand the consequences of one's decisions and actions on one's life or health or the life or health of others. When does it uh, become a psychiatric or neurologic emergency? How is this defined in the law? It is a condition presenting a serious and immediate threat to the health and well-being of a service user or any other person affected by a mental health condition or to the health and well-being of others requiring immediate medical intervention. Patient C needed admission for work up and possible treatment also needed medications to calm him down so necessary diagnostics can be undertaken and the safety of patient C may not be insured properly in a medical ward or floors due to uh, later on, uh, not mentioned in the story, aggressive or belligerent behavior and or refusal for admission. These are some of the psychiatric emergency situations. And we can determine if the person has, our service user, has temporary loss of decision-making capacity if he is unable to do the following, which we highlighted in the previous uh, case of patient A. We could determine decision-making capacity or the temporary loss of it when uh, we have the following. There's a communication of choice uh, by asking the question, have you decided whether to go along with your doctor's suggestion for treatment? Can you tell me what your choice is? Second, when there's factual understanding of the issues, please tell me in your own words what your doctor told you about what is wrong with you. What happens if you decide not to go along with your doctor's proposed treatment? Third important issue is the appreciation of the situation as well as, as its consequences. And this could be illustrated when we ask the service user, please explain to me 
what you really believe is wrong with your health right now. Do you believe you need some kind of treatment? What they believe will happen if you are not treated. And finally, there should be the ability to rationally manipulate the information given. Please explain to me what you really believe is wrong with your health right now. Do you believe you need some kind of treatment? What do you believe will happen if you are not treated? Now, what happens if there's temporary loss of decision-making capacity? And I highlighted this earlier that we could go back if the uh, service user has made an advanced directive. And in the advanced directive, a service user may set out his or her preference in relation to treatment through a signed, dated, and notarized advanced directive executed for this purpose. An advanced directive may be revoked by a notarized revocation. The other path could be having a legal representative. And this could be stated also in the advanced directive. A service user may designate a person of legal age to act as his or her legal representative through a notarized document executed for that purpose. And also another remedy would be the legal representative who functions as providing the service user with support and help they could act as a substitute decision maker, especially during times of emergency or when the service user has lost the decision-making capacity. They could assist the service user vis-a-vis -vis the exercise of any right, and they could be consulted with respect to any treatment or therapy received by the service user. However, and this is based on actual practice, uh, our service users may fail to appoint a legal representative. In this case, if the service user fails to appoint a legal representative, the following persons shall act as a legal representative in the following chronological order. First would be the spouse, if any, unless permanently separated from the service user by a decree issued by a court of competent jurisdiction or unless such spouse has abandoned or been abandoned by the service user for any period which has not yet come to an end. Second to that would be non-minor children. Then we move to either parent uh, by mutual consent if the service user is a minor. If not yet available, then the chief administrator or medical director of the mental health care facility acts as the legal representative. And if yet unavailable, then uh, a person who might be appointed by the court. The legal representative must be recognized by the mental health professional workers and service providers. They must be provided the same advice, guidance, and support, and they must be assisted in making decisions in keeping with the standard of substituted judgment based on the service user's preferences, if any, as expressed in an advance directive or as documented in the medical record. If the service user's advanced directive does not show any such preferences, assistance must be provided in making decisions according to the service user's best interest as based on the following. The degree and the potential benefit of treatment, the impairments that may result from treatment, and the quality of life as experienced by the service user. I'd like to borrow also an ethical opinion. Providing advice related to topics of bioethics, 
the U.S. President's Commission for the Study of Ethical Problems in Medicine and Biomedical and Behavioral Research stated that informed consent is rooted in the fundamental recognition reflected in the legal presumption of competency that adults are entitled to accept or reject healthcare interventions on the basis of their own personal values and in furtherance of their own personal goals. We move to section 12, uh, which is the internal review board. Public and private health facilities by the Republic Act 11036 are mandated to create their respective internal review boards to expeditiously review all cases disputes and controversies involved, uh, involving the treatment, restraint, or confinement of service users within their facilities. As I mentioned earlier, this may uh, be postponed in terms of implementation for the uh, meantime, while um, they are trying, the Council, Philippine Council for Mental Health, is trying to determine the constitution uh, and organization of the IRB. This board is supposed to uh, be composed of a representative from the DOH, a representative from, from the Commission on Human Rights, a person nominated by an organization representing service users and their families, as duly accredited by the Philippine Council for Mental Health, and other designated members deemed necessary to be determined under the implementing rules and regulations. So far, uh, one of these determinations includes that the independent member, although non-voting, preferably should be an expert or a mental health professional. I'll delve deeper right now into talking about the Psychiatric Advanced Directive. So let's talk about patient D who has been diagnosed with delirious mania, which did respond to the combination of medications and had been in the hospital for over four weeks with very slight improvement of symptoms. He had a good therapeutic alliance with his psychiatrist who was in a bind because based on limited scientific evidence and his clinical experience, uh, suggested to the family that ECT be tried, which the family unfortunately refused. However, because he was assessed to have a temporary loss of decision-making capacity, the psychiatrist could not impose ECT treatment. Months after the episode when the patient had reached remission, his psychiatrist suggested to the patient to develop a psychiatric advance directive. Based on the implementing rules and regulations of RA 11036, the advance in the under section nine or advanced directive, a service user may set out his or her preference in relation to any form of treatment or therapies, but it has to be in a signed, dated, and notarized uh, document executed for this purpose. <clears throat> An advanced directive may be revoked by a new advanced directive or by a notarized revocation. All mental health professionals attending to a service user who is clinically determined to be capable of giving informed consent and or does not exhibit impairment or temporary loss of decision-making capacity are required to secure a signed advanced directive from the service user. An advanced directive is a document written by a service user should circumstances arise in the future, preventing them from being able to make a decision. It may take the form of either or both of the following. Could be an instructive advanced directive, which is a written document giving 
instructions on a specific treatment plan a service user prefers should a situation arise wherein he or she becomes unable to make a decision. Or it could be, second, a proxy advance directive, which is a written document naming a healthcare proxy to make treatment decisions for the service user should a situation arise wherein he or she becomes unable to make a decision. I'd rather call this a psychiatric advance directives. As we know, uh, previously, we are aware of general advanced directives uh, when somebody uh, dies or meets an accident. So this is, and it was developed almost simultaneously with these, the psychiatric advanced directives. They are legal documents that allow people with mental illness to state their preferences as stated in uh, RA 11036. It's good because it can help an individual with mental illness or a mental health condition preserve their autonomy while ensuring the right care is given at the right time. People who complete their psychiatric advance directives are more likely to work collaboratively with their clinicians experience fewer coercive uh, crisis interventions, and they feel that their personal needs for mental health services are being met. When these uh, psychiatric advance directives are used correctly, medical providers, local hospital, police departments, and caregivers can provide care that is aligned with the uh, individual's preferences. We can even have a uh, psychiatric advance directive that could be based on cognitive therapy, where in information regarding the provisions on uh, their directives are explored based on past experiences of mental health crises, the identification of their relapse triggers, and what could be the earliest prodromal signs that there is an impending um, a mental health condition, acute condition uh, going to happen. The assessment of past experiences of medication, what worked, what didn't work, and other treatments, uh, both helpful and unhelpful. The evaluation of the cost and benefit of each choice of treatment and which circumstances a given treatment is acceptable and when they are not. The long-term relapse prevention strategies are also discussed, including coping strategies which should be used or not if a specific situation arises. Also, the individual drafts the advanced directive statements independently, but can certainly ask for support if needed. Specific thought is given here to ensuring that the directive is readily accessible when needed. And during further episodes of crisis, the advanced directive will be used if appropriate and its content openly discussed with the originator. Now, after the episode of the illness, the directive is rigorous, rigorously reviewed to just ensure that it best meets the individual's particular needs and desires. This is an advanced directive, a sample, uh, which we use in our clinics um, in Makati Medical Center. So it states I, uh, et cetera, since blank uh, date, I have been diagnosed with the following by my psychiatrist of choice, Dr. So-and-so with office address so-and-so. Since uh, this date, I have experienced numerous episodes were in I sought uh, psychiatric help from this doctor. I now make an advanced directive. It could be the designation of a legal representative. Uh, and uh, these are the functions that they will exercise. The preference of treatment is stated there. The supported decision making uh, through the following individuals. It is signed, uh, documented, and notarized. 
So with that, uh, I think we have to remember why we do this. Uh, we're following no less than uh, the Bible, which says we need to speak for people who cannot speak for themselves and protect the rights of all who are hopeless. So with this, I'd like to thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Renesa Maniego and Dr. Tolentino. Before we uh, listen to the presentation of uh, Dr. Lourdes Ignacio, we would just like to uh, ask for your indulgence uh, that we might be extending a little bit uh, past uh, 8 o'clock, but we hope to be able to answer your questions. So even now, we would like to invite you to send your questions to our Q&A box, especially from the first two presentations. And uh, we will try to answer them. Our speakers generously um, uh, would, would want to uh, agree to, to, to answer some of them. However, most of this, I think, will be sent to you privately. But we will choose a few questions later during the Q&A that we would like to highlight in the open forum. So please keep your questions coming and then uh, we will try to uh, address them. Thank you very much. And now let's listen to the presentation of uh, our uh, very own Dr. Lourdes Ignacio. Good evening. Thank you very much for organizing this special webinar and revisit the men Philippine mental health law. My presentation this evening will really touch on one of the major advocacies that the Philippine Council for Mental Health in responding to its mandate as the policy making and implementing agency of the law has conceptualized and presented for everyone to adapt. This has therefore become an official document as PCMH Resolution number 2020-003. And we encourage everyone, ourselves as psychiatrists and our colleagues in the mental health field to take a closer look at this concept for mental health in the Philippines because this is expected to provide us the framework in understanding mental health, in planning for the implementation of the various mental health programs and services the law has mandated us to undertake. My presentation this evening will really touch on one of the issues that has confronted us at the Council, which is really now a response to global and mental health challenges that has drawn us to start thinking for a reorienting, reframing mental health. This presentation will be one, I'll share with you the highlights of the Philippine Mental Health Law, reorienting, reframing the concept of mental health in the Philippines, introduce to you the Philippine Council for Mental Health, which is the policy making and implementing agency created by the law for its effective implementation and somehow share with you some details on the concept of mental health that we have now proposed and implemented, providing mental health a broader framework. And finally, we'll give a summary of this presentation. The highlights of the Philippine mental health law are the following. It is rights-based, 
affirming the rights of everyone to human dignity and access to quality humane of services. We know that this is very crucial, especially in our field, because the people that avail of our services, our patients, have really been subjected to the abuse of their human rights, have in fact been subjected to unfortunate dehumanization as we all look at the term taong rasa, which we now have to advocate to eliminate. The second highlight is the institutional reforms that will be expected for better governance and leadership. And essentially, the law has provided the creation of the Philippine Council for Mental Health to provide this governance and leadership in mental health. The law has also shown the direction for a transformational shift, so-called deinstitutionalization, which means a shift from the predominantly hospital-based mental health services to an emphasis on stronger community mental health services. The fourth is really the expansion of the concept and strategies for intervention towards the promotion and integration of mental health beyond the health sector into educational institutions, workplaces, and community. And finally, but not really the least one, just as equally important, is the improvement of the information systems, the, the conduct of evidence-based researches, and the conduct of programs to determine competencies for institutional capacities. Let's step back a little while because some of this reorientation and reframing is drawn also for certain revisions that the law has articulated in terms of very definitions. While there is no revision in the general definition of health, which is the state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, as articulated by the WHO, our present concept for reorientation and reframing is, has led us to advocate that this definition could be revised to include the state of complete physical, mental, and social and spiritual well-being, not merely the absence of disease and infirmity. The definition of mental health as provided for in Republic Act 11036, which is of course the Mental Health Law of 2018, provides almost the same definition as the WHO definition of mental health. But the line which we are showing to you in bold idealized sentence is really the addition that our own law has come up with in the definition for mental health. And this is uniquely Philippine. We have stated that in addition to really seeking the state of well-being in which the individual realizes one's own abilities and potentials, copes adequately with ordinary life stresses, we have added the line, displays resilience in the face of extreme life events simply because we are really conscious, and you will agree with me, that extreme life events, extreme life experiences have been before us because of the overwhelming disasters, both natural and man-made, displacements of families because of overseas employment, abuses for domestic, from domestic violence and child abuse, has been on our plate. And therefore, we have to address the psychosocial consequences of these experiences allows for ourselves to come up with programs that will strengthen resilience of those affected and possibly really overcome 
the psychosocial and mental health consequences so that they can proceed on to acquire a state of well-being, to work productively and properly, to be able to make a possible contribution to the community. Another revision in the mental health law that I'd like to draw your attention is the fact that the law does not include the term mental disorder. Articulating the recognition to do away with the use of this term, since this has led to abuse of rights and dehumanization of our patients. Note also the addition of neurological disorders in the coverage of the law. So, instead of mental disorders, the law defines mental health condition to refer to psychiatric and neurologic conditions characterized by clinically significant disturbances in an individual's cognition, emotional regulation, or behavior that reflects a genetic or acquired dysfunction in the neurobiological, psychosocial, or developmental processes underlying mental functioning. I would also presume that everybody in this webinar would already have had a chance to read in its entirety the mental health law of 2018, because the mental health law now calls attention to a reorientation a reframing of the concept of mental health in the Philippines. To clearly understand that mental health is a basic component of health and to include in its coverage psychiatric, neurologic conditions and psychosocial problems, taking a generalist view in its coverage of these conditions and therefore these conditions are to be seen as an integral part of general health care. Very crucial because so far mental health is still regarded in the periphery of general health care delivery, although the law has specific provision on why and how it is going to be integrated. Number two is to reframe the concept of mental health from a limited focus on the individual alone basically a clinical case perspective which is still the prevailing orientation to a wider focus on the majority of the population simply because the lost vision is mental health of the filipino hence focuses on the healthy to expand therefore to promote their mental health and psychosocial well-being sustain this to be productive and continue to contribute to the community and be protected from the risk of ill health. This prevailing focus on the individual specifically is a focus on the body, which is physical health, and has neglected focus on the mind, social relationships, and the spirit within the individual. This neglect leads to the inadequacy of the more clinical, individually focused orientation to understand mental health. Hence, the need to reorient, reframe, and a conceptual framework, a biological, psychological, social, spiritual, conceptual framework in understanding mental health. Let me illustrate this a little bit. Look at the diagram and I titled this the concept of mental health condition using anxiety, depression as an example. If one is in the prevailing perspective, this anxiety, depression will be looked at from the clinical approach focus on the individual, therefore, looks at this condition as symptoms right away. Therefore, the perspective is clinical. Again, it will lead to intervention which is limited on a focus on the individual, 
for psychosocial intervention may be counseling or psychopharmacologic medications. Therefore, it is limited in its being based on a single perspective. The reorientation that is called for or the reframing of the concept of mental health leads us to adopt a broader approach which is a focus on phenomena beyond the individual considering the interconnectedness of the individual and the environment and not right away looking at anxiety depression from a symptom more clinically oriented perspective anxiety therefore will be looked at as a signal reaction to what goes on as in the very environmental stress or change as a signal it generates the necessary coping in the individual which is still within the purview of the individual reaction and therefore looked at as protective because this will strengthen the resilience of the individual and generate his coping mechanism which could be really not leading to any symptom of illness. The same is true in looking at depression as an experience of mourning because of a loss. The mourning itself is a reaction of an acceptance for the loss. Looking at the loss, therefore, as something that the individual will have to adapt to, find alternative resources to overcome the loss and therefore the depression experience is adaptive and allows the individual to go over the loss and possibly just adapt to the loss and move on with another ways of handling his life. The intervention is therefore holistic. It considers the individual, his reactions, is assess this generation of his psychological mechanisms, even his physical reactions, looks at the social perspective of the sources of anxiety, the sources of loss, and move on to develop the individual coping and recovering from it without getting into so-called symptoms to have been protected from it or adapted to the loss. Hence, the use of the four dimensions in the perspective for reactions in mental health, which I will be discussing in a few minutes. Let me introduce to you the Philippine Council for Mental Health, which is very important because not much awareness is still going on as to the existence of this council, but section 4P of RA 11036 provides for the creation of a Philippine Council for Mental Health as the policy making, advisory, and implementing agency for the effective implementation of the law. Basically, it provides the governance and leadership for mental health programs so that the law could be effectively implemented and the council in its nine membership structure from six government sectors and three civil society organizations articulate the fact that the responsibility for mental health is no longer the responsibility of one sector alone which we know is traditionally health sector and mental health is now everybody's business. Hence, the perspective of the governance and leadership and implementation of mental health programs is now multi-sectoral, multi-dimensional, and therefore everybody's business. The Philippine Council for Mental Health which was organized as soon as the implementing rules and regulations of the law has been approved, came up with a national mental health strategic framework 
in late, in late 2019 and this is being presented to you today because this framework has actually been in place since 2019 and will be subjected to another review in 2023. So we are still in the context of the framework of the, this particular <clears throat> in this particular diagram. Under these circles is really the view to the continuum of mental health from the healthy and the asymptomatic to those with non-specific psychosocial problems to those with fully diagnosed the mental health conditions and their recovery. Throughout this, the view, the framework for a strategic plan would be looking at mental health and well-being of all Filipinos as the objective, coming through with programs for comprehensive, accessible, integrated and humane services, adequate governance of these programs and activities, wide information backed by research in a wider activities on promotion and prevention carried through within the framework of a biopsychosocial spiritual model looking at the concept itself that will be rights-based providing services that would have a recovery approach through balanced care and this will be carried out with the whole of government and whole of society not only by the health system but the other sectors in the society crucial to mental health and now at this point in time the law has specified the through the membership of the council the sectors for education local government, labor and employment, Commission on Human Rights, Commission on Higher Education, and the Departments of Social Welfare. Right away, when the Philippine Council started moving to implement the mental health law, it saw the need for clear language and common understanding of concepts on mental health, stakeholder consultations on this strategic plan had clearly shown that there really had been an, a this unorganized, not quite clear language, the use of mental health terms, or even in the understanding of concepts of mental health that has been prevailing, in other words, kanya-kanya ang programa sa mental clear language and common understanding and this generated the, the direction that it should have three perspectives in addressing this need. The perspectives from the point of view of protection and promotion programs, which will be carried out the perspective of the self and the individual at societal level and the whole system itself, so that from the point of view of the self, which is the individual, we need to adopt the biopsychosocial spiritual framework in understanding the individual for the promotion of well being and mental health and the prevention of risks for ill health. In this way, the protection issue would really address the understanding that one should own one's mental health, understand one's stress and individual coping. Further on, the perspective for the promotion of mental health 
from the societal perspective is to understand that mental health is a unique product of social and environmental influences. Therefore, an interconnectedness between the self and society, between the individual and his social conditions. In that sense, protective protection perspective will have to look at as mental health now goes beyond the individual. It is going to be everybody's business. And as the council has articulated it, it will get into a whole of government and a whole of society approach, therefore broad in its view. Because the system should be able to look at mental health as a public good, as a fundamental human right. And within the context of that system, mental health equates to sustainable development of the country. And mental health investment is to be promoted, hence the integration of mental health in universal health care. This is just capturing what I've just said, the interconnectedness of the cell, society, and the environment. And we refer here environment, the external environment, which is the social system outside the individual. Only. And but there is an environment, which is the internal environment within that individual, which we will later refer to as the spirit within that individual that cannot be denied, although it probably cannot be observed. So the major reframing to our concept of mental health is this way, the self, the society in the inter and the environment cannot be isolated from each other. They are interconnected. When you look at the individual, the individual is interconnected to the community and the society within its community. And within that is an ecological system, an environment with which they negotiate life. So let me now get a little bit more in detail to explain how this framework is to be understood. We are now proposing that move all of us in the mental health field, especially as psychiatrists, who is expected to live in this advocacy framework, is to understand this and adapt this framework in understanding mental health. And there has to be assurance to everyone that the working through and the coming up of this framework has been the product of the convergence of evidence-based studies in the neurosciences, genetics, psychological, behavioral, and social sciences, as well as the emerging studies and experiences of those pursuing the contributions of faith-based concepts and spirituality on health. Because we know, and I quote Steiner here, when he's, he articulates the fact that real medicine, real healthcare can only exist when it embraces the human being in body, mind, and spirit. I will start with each of the dimensions in the framework with the biological dimension, which is the physical. Somewhere along the way, this has been referred to as the biomedical dimension, which prevails. But this biological dimension focuses on the brain, and we all need to understand the fact that the brain serves as the integrative system by which the individual person is directed, supported to interact with the environment to maintain life. So the brain really integrates the functions of the other organ systems, the heart, the respiratory system, the kidneys, the, the liver, the immune systems, the allergic systems, the mus musculoskeletal systems. So to support 
man in its interaction with the environment so that life is sustained. Hence, the concept the brain and the self is very clear. So therefore, the biological dimension cannot stand on its own. It right away calls forth the understanding of the physical domain, which is focusing on the brain and its relationship to the self, which we will talk about in a few minutes. When we study the physical, understand the physical, the brain, and its relationship to the development of self, we need to look more specifically into studies on genetics and how gene expression is influenced by the environment, the stresses, prenatal and throughout the life course, which is the influenced by normal physical growth and development, but going side by side with personality development, as well as the stresses in the adversities of the environment. We look at positive environment, therefore, we talk about physical activity, nutrition, in the range of support and protection, and provision of protection and safety. Two important things from understanding the brain and the self is neural circuitry, which facilitates the organization of the body to maximum function, its responses to stress through the immune system, and the thinking processes, emotional experiences, and consequent action. Finally, the understanding of neuronal plasticity which clarifies that neuronal cells can be modified by environmental influences. So when we talk biological dimension in understanding mental health, it looks into specific issues regarding the brain from the studies in the neurosciences. But it, it is related to the development of the self and the psychological dimension, as well as the social dimension. The second dimension is psychological dimension. And addressing the psychological dimension points to the concept of personality from which evolves the self. Throughout history, these terms have been used to describe that which makes us who we are as human beings. Personality, which is the core of the psychological dimension, is the sum total of the physical, mental, emotional, social, and spiritual characteristics of the individuals and the ways by which he or she presents himself or herself outward. It is personality that allows one to observe, evaluate, and assess an individual. It is that personality that allows us to diagnose, to observe, to improve the individual. And this is therefore addressing the unique combination of mental processes that defines an individual's instinctual urges, limits of control to consideration of rightness and wrongness, express as patterns of behavior, the thought processes, the emotional experiences, and the consequent action in terms of behavior. The other, the, the other component of the psychological dimension is the self, which we know is the foundation of all human behaviors. It represents the individual's personality traits and patterns developed throughout the stages of life from childhood to senescence through which he relates and adapts to the external environment, which differentiates him or her from other individuals. In our other term, this is referred to as ego. And there are three important aspects of the self. That's self-identity, who he or she is, self-esteem, his inner evaluation of himself or herself, and his self-worth, 
this recognition of the regard of others of his own value to them. The third dimension that we need to understand is the dimension that articulates the fact that the individual self represents his personality patterns through which he relates to the social environment. There should really be the understanding by everyone that the person and his environment is interconnected. We know no man is an island. And in considering understanding the social dimension and putting that in our understanding, this, this dimension in the total evaluation of mental health, we consider social roles and relationships, social institutions in the community, the social determinants that influence mental health, social attitudes towards anything mental, stigma, social burden, and social suffering. Society or social systems, the external environment, is ex distinct from the self. Society is distinct from individuals within it. They are more than the sum of its individual components there evolves a society patterns of behaviors that are the bad products of various reciprocal behaviors of the many individuals within it. Society, therefore, is really distinct from the individuals or the self in that particular individual, although they are interconnected. The other important considerations when we talk mental health and the social institutions in the community, they provide the needs of the individual in his life to optimize the quality of that life and their community, and more importantly, to provide the establishment and development of the social support system, which is vital to the life of the community and the people within it. A major example from which we all have learned from as we ourselves or those who go to disaster areas. When, when there is overwhelming devastation, disorganization of the social environment of the community, there is loss of social support system and that impact led, leads to mental health consequences or psychosocial consequences experience by the people or the survivors of those 16 life experiences. This institution should be in place, coordinated and integrated so that people can continue to be physically, mentally, socially and spiritually well. In other words, this institution should provide in its coordinated and integrated nature a stability so that it can provide a social support system for the individuals in it. This is just illustrated with this diagram. The individual in the middle needs that reciprocal relationship to the integrated social institutions which really are existent, but we take for granted because they're there. But these constitutions and the political institutions that provide governance, stability, and law and order. Health institutions that address health conditions from birth to death, including, of course, the individual illnesses and the promotion of health. The educational institutions, the schools, and all the rest of the other educational organizations that provide man the opportunities or the system with which he can hone up, gather knowledge, hone up his potentials and skills so that he can reach a degree of actualization and provide contribution to his community. Economic institutions are those institutions like banks, marketplaces, financial institutions that really provide man 
the resources to get these basic needs as well as to aspire for a better quality of life. Family institutions is the immediate social institution for the individual in the home, but this is augmented by the social welfare institutions that addresses the needs for food, clothing, shelter, neighborhood, and a sense of community and belongingness. Finally, there is the religious institutions, the churches, that provide man the opportunity to experience his relationship with the supreme being that provides inner guidance, meaning, and peace. So generally we take for granted because this is really what is in the society or in the community we have. But all these are existent and have a reciprocal relationship with the individual and their interconnectedness mean mental and social health. I'm listing only the domains of social determinants. There are five as identified by the Lancet Commission in 2018, but we all understand this to be the social factors to mental health. And if you can have a chance to get a copy of this presentation, then you may have a chance to really go a little bit more in detail, which I cannot do in the interest of time today. Important also in our field are social attitudes. Number one there is stigma. Even psychiatrists can get to be stigmatized. Our patients sometimes don't even acknowledge our presence, even if we truly have felt that they have benefited from us because they just can't accept the fact that they have seen us, their psychiatrists, or they even give us this kind of identity as this rank. Anyway, that's a major uh, consideration in the social dimension because it brings negative pre prejudice, oftentimes dehumanizing attitudes. But important too are social burdens from mental health conditions, the disability of some of these conditions, the economic disadvantage that is brought about, especially if the mental health condition affects the breadwinner in the family, therefore leading to a certain degree of income inequality. But generally, these social attitudes which is still prevailing, which we have to work on, is really the generalized, negative, discriminating attitudes towards anything mental. The last item in the social dimension is social suffering. This has been written up by Kleinman in 1997 in a book of this title, and he brings our attention to understanding this concept which brings into a single space an assemblage of human problems that have their origins and consequences in the devastating injuries that social forces can inflict on human experience. And social suffering, therefore, is a collective phenomenon. This sounds like a relatively new concept, but I think it's only our recent awareness of this undeniable fact. And therefore, we need for us to be fully aware because this highlights the undeniable fact of pain and suffering, physical, emotional, social, even spiritual pain is not experienced by the individual alone. It is shared by everyone in his social space of family, friends, neighbors, and community. So anybody sick from whatever source it is in his life is not suffering alone. In fact, when he's suffering alone, he tries to involve others the cry of the desperate in suicide is an attempt to cry for that help 
because the aloneness in that pain cannot be sustained. The last dimension is the spiritual dimension. And this, I think, is one of the major areas in ourselves reframing our understanding of mental health. Because so far, it's been only the biopsychosocial model for understanding health and mental health. But now, in the recent development of the conceptualization of mental health in the Philippines, we cannot anymore ignore this dimension in the individual's life. The continuing occurrence of extreme life events, which we are impacted on because of our vulnerability as a country, its own geographic and geologic characteristics in the Pacific, the impact of the COVID-19 very recent has generated in us, in this country, and I think around the world, the belief that the spiritual dimension and universalized cannot be ignored. And maybe you can agree with me that this resonates in the Filipino being culturally known to be spiritual. And we cannot deny that our immediate reactions to the uncertainty, the isolation imposed on us to draw upon our inner resources because the uncertainty of the world around us is really terribly overwhelming. To draw into our own selves, our inner resources has brought us to what we Filipinos are comfortable with, to draw into our own context of the spirit within us the God within us. And that's why we think that this is resonating with the Philippine to be spiritual. That's why we are bold to really say our framework for mental health includes this last dimension and cannot therefore be ignored. And I continue to look forward to every one of us to include this awareness and this discussion in planning for interventions, development of services, provision of therapy, provision of care, because this is part of a human experience. How do we look at this? As I said, spirituality is distinct from religion, because religion is a set of beliefs. But spirituality is the belief, a feeling, an experience of something greater than the self, something more to be in human, experience as a connection to a spirit within, which becomes a source of inner guidance. It is therefore an experience, and it is beyond beliefs, organized rituals, modes of worshiping according to a structured organization of a faith of a religion. It is an experience of something greater, of an awareness of a spirit within, integrated in the self as, as a person's search for meaning, purpose, and peace in life especially in crisis. To the Filipino, the spirit within is his God. To the Buddhist, it is Buddha. To the Muslims, it is Allah, etc. So it is distinct from religion. This experience of a spirit within strengthens in the individual's recognition and connectedness with the Supreme Being Consequently, an experience of a sense of oneness with this being within him and with everyone generating, which is crucial for anyone in the helping profession, that experience of compassion. It is spirituality that is a universal human experience that really generates 
our compassion towards another because we feel one with that other. And the spiritual dimension that I'm referring to also is quite natural because prayer is known to be a Filipino's major coping in times of crisis. And I study some time ago on what's wrong and what's right with the Filipino has identified spirituality as one of the Filipinos' major coping mechanism, especially in times of crisis. This is just a diet. This is now the diagram that captures all the biological, the psychological, the social, and spiritual considerations in understanding the framework for mental health. The highlights of the mental health law clearly points to a reorientation, a reframing of our understanding of mental health. A reorientation, actually a refocus, a reminder that mental health is an integral and not a special component of health. The state of physical, mental, social, and spiritual well-being in man should hold to say that there is no health without mental health. A reframing pointing to the expansion in understanding the concept of mental health from the prevailing limited individually focused clinical case perspective to a broader multidimensional approach a BPSS or a biopsychosocial spiritual perspective in understanding a human being that should really come into consideration every time services are planned for and implemented, treatment is undertaken, or therapy is engaging a patient. There has to be this four dimension in understanding a human being. Reframing leading to the recognition that there is really the undeniable interconnectedness of the individual and the environment. This broader view on mental health clarifies that the mental health law provides for the recognition of everyone's right to be taken care of when suffering from mental health condition. At the same time, it calls for a broadened perspective to see a case with a broadened perspective for the development of a comprehensive, humanistic, and accessible mental health services for all. The Council for Mental Health articulates this expanded framework for governance and leadership through its own structure because of the participation of a diverse multi-sectoral group of professionals and advocates and the recognition that the pursuit of mental health through the programs being implemented is not only one sector's responsibility, which traditionally up to now is still the health sector, but is to be looked at as now everybody's business. We are in the midst of change, reforms, transformations, and the need to reorient so that we can effectively continue to advocate and work together for the implementation of the Mental Health Act and achieve mental health for all Philippines. In doing so, we need not look for new landscapes or new theories, but only to be open, deconstruct our old beliefs, acknowledge the initial negativity, give attention to what's presently going on in our new reality, where changes are forthcoming and 
therefore, we need to have new eyes at looking and doing things. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much to our esteemed speakers. We'd like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Samaniego, Dr. Tolentino, and Dr. Ignacio, and we would like to we would like to put them on spotlight as well here with Agnes. No? Agnes, yes. Ka and <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you so much for uh, our Anundro. Very. Uh, actually, I'm inspired by all the, the the things that have been discussed, and also thinking what will be the future for for all of us uh, in terms of, of the implementation of the mental health law, and kung paano nga tayo move forward after this talk. Yeah. So, Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time, yeah. so we'll dive into the few questions that we've received. No, uh, I believe you have a question for Doctor Samaniego, uh, Agnes. Yes, so I will uh, throw the first question. Uh, this is for Dr. Samaniego. Uh, given the impressive work of a lot of past pre uh, PPA presidents you know, in the mental health law and its IRR, uh, and being also you yourself, a past president of PPA, how do you envision PPA's mm -hmm. position in the mental health ecosystem? Thank you, Dr. Agnes. So with regard to that question, um, I think the best thing that we can contribute um, is to work on, because I think the main issue right now, uh, now that we have been able to provide the much needed legislative framework for the formal delivery of a comprehensive mental health care, the main challenge really now is shifted to ensuring effective policy designs and implementation and how they can be strengthened and supported. So there's such a thing as policy implementation gap. So that's a well-established confounding phenomenon that um, is viewed to be complex, multifaceted, multi-level, and something that applies to a lot, to almost all um, um, republic acts or laws. So I think if we focus on that specifically now, um, I think that would go a long way. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that, Dr. Samaniego, because yeah, PPA is actually one of the key stakeholders for this mental health law. Thank you very so, much, uh, Dr. Casino and Dr. Samaniego. We have actually questions for Dr. Tolentino, and Dr. Tolentino tried to answer them through the chat box. Unfortunately, Dr. Tolentino, uh, we could not send it out. So can I just request you your answer? Uh, uh, I think it's brief naman po because there, there are specific questions. Um, would you want me to read for? The first question is, do you need to fulfill all of the four points we mentioned in determining the decision-making capacity? Also, do we need to have an independent physician, psychiatrist, other than the attending psychiatrist, who would assess the patient's decision-making capacity? Thank you for those questions. Uh, yes, first and foremost, regarding... Uh the competency in decision-making capacity, those have to be fulfilled. They actually come, uh, those were borrowed from the uh, legal minds that develop uh, decision-making capacity and they are well um, read sa ating mga textbooks on legal med, si Applebaum et, et al. And uh, just to repeat, kailangan merong com uh, communication of choice uh, second is there has to be a factual understanding of the issues. And then, of course, the appreciation of the situation and its consequences. Kahit pa ikutikutin nung uh, interviewer or yung, yung uh, mental health professional nag, nagkakausap sa patient. And there should be the ability for uh, rational implementation. Uh, there's a second part to that question, uh, which is, Joff, gusto mo ikaw o ano? Go ahead. Yes, po. It, yung, yung second part is yung conferring with a colleague. Uh, I put that more as a suggestion. Now, let me just put a context to that. No, In the development of the law, uh, obviously, we had to make sure 
that indeed the rights of the patient is upheld. No? Uh, in other countries, so we looked at uh, existing models. And in other countries, uh, there will in fact be an independent mental health professional or psychiatrist appointed by either the court, the government, etc. That has to uh, inspect, okay, if there are involuntary admissions or involuntary treatments, within 48 hours, they have to make a decision if the patient can in fact stay on in the hospital. Our objection during the deliberations was that this was unimplementable in our country, owing to the fact that we only have less than uh, less than 600 or, or so psychiatrists at that time when uh, we were deliberating, uh, and and in some provinces there wouldn't even there would only be one. Okay, uh, in the whole province, so this was unimplementable. So. Um, not only was it changed to a body, the Internal Review Board, uh, the time by which the IRB can uh, make actions on uh, treatment, hospitalization, seclusion, and all that uh, was extended to 15 days. Originally 30 days, but uh, it was a bit too long naman, so it was moved to 15 days. So uh, as I mentioned also in my talk, unfortunately, for now, uh, we, uh, either the Department of Health nor the Commission on Human Rights, which is, uh, doesn't practically have much of a budget, more so uh, new recruitments, uh, it is still under deliberation how this uh, IRB is going to be implemented uh, in the law. So, thank you. Thank very you. much, Dr. Tolentino. Um... Yeah, and now we'll move on to the question to Dr. Ignacio, Dr. Casino. Uh, hello, hello, ma'am. Good evening. So actually, no, ang ang kanda, ma'am, and very enlightening yung yung discussion nyo. It's just that, siguro, we really don't have much time to talk about uh, to talk more about this one. But my question is, right now we already have this reframed concept of mental health uh, by the Council, by the Philippine Council for Mental Health. So, sa tingin niyo po, or your opinion, how do we start as a as PPA? How or where will we start in institutionalizing this reframed uh, concept of mental health? I think I'm coming. I'm coming again. Thank you very much for giving this a voice. Um, I'm coming from the point of view of uh, Philippine Council for Mental Health, but I'm also sitting here as the founding president of Philippine Psychiatric Association. And if you get a chance to read my own president's folder for 1973, I came through with a theme for my presidency then, out of the shadows into the sunshine. So for PPA, you know, and this is the message I would probably like to look at PPA to really now gain its, its position in leadership in the mental health movement in this country. You've, we've all labored through, I was there since 1989, Renee. You mm -hmm. know, I've gone through all these frustrations and struggles and hit in Congress, etc., etc. And I've also been in the background, even in the 2010. I was on the forefront in the 2010 movement and the background with June in the 2016, 17, 18, pushing for its inclusion of the Philippine Council for Mental Health, which was our position paper also in 1998 with President Ramos. So uh, at this particular point, I like to think I'm retiring, <laughs> you know, so it's now PPA out of the shadows into the sunshine on its 50th anniversary must really come together and, and come through with really what it has come out with these leaders, L-E-A-D-E-R-S, you know, uh, logo in our logo, and maybe settle, one of which is take a leadership position, which I'd like to think in getting, including Ed Tolentino, he is 
representing professional organizations in the council to really get everybody to be on the same, what we call the same page as far as looking at this biopsychosocial spiritual framework. And in fact, I, allow me, Rene, to ask you, because my main reference in looking into that spiritual dimension is down your alley, um, Rene. It's Jungian, you know. And I'd like that part strengthened by Rene, in fact, because we have had various things. And right now at the Philippine Council for Health Research and Development, we have a major project on just looking into spirituality, religiosity, health, with special focus on mental health, which came through from defining it to getting the opinions of professionals, practitioners in mental health, now into research. So we are at the council level, but I encourage Dr. Cabralim, who is the technical committee on research in council, to also get in there. One of the things I think that we need to come together is hold hands, collaborate, ask each other if we can try to talk on the same page, use the same language, and encourage other ones. When I said deconstruct old beliefs, really try to see because it is really very relevant. It is a call for the times not to be defensive anymore, not to hide anymore, because spirituality, which is a major addition to the concept, is a very apt term. We are preparing a paper encouraging WHO, in fact, to change the definition. In 1998, at the Executive Committee meeting of the World Health Assembly, they, in fact, had gone to this discussion, but somewhere along the way, there is this kind of hesitancy to consider spirituality. But then in one of the readings I have, um, there is that article that when all else fails, everybody is like in a foxhole, they call on to God, you know, this kind of thing. And therefore, why not do it in the ordinary sense and not just go and call it on, it, on the foxhole? And it's really leadership. Rene had mentioned something and somewhere along the way, we needed to have the political will to really come through with this. And I'm just here as an advocate. I'm just here as one thing to say thank you to you for all the time that you're giving us to present this. And possibly when we first presented this in Luz Katigbak's time when on the onset of the pandemic, and we, we asked the question in one of our webinars in 2020, is spirituality the missing link in psychiatry? There was an immediate response of PPA because the 2021 annual convention has for its theme, biopsychosocial spiritual framework in psychiatry. So maybe all we have to do is continue to sustain the effort, tell our colleagues in the other psychological uh, professional organizations, remind them that right here in our midst is the leadership to come through with a reframing of concepts, revisions of definitions. I think when we drop mental disorders in our definition and just put mental health conditions, I think that when we put neurological disorders, we were right on track to put it in our mental health law. And we're, we're doing this as Philippine, Pinoy, when we place re space resilience in our definition for mental health, that was us. And that's why I'm saying we're out of the shadows, we're into the sunshine, we're leading the way. And probably this is the time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Ignacio. Uh, maybe Dr. Samaniego, Dr. Talindi, you want to <laughs> quickly lang po because you were mentioned there, and then we will end. <laughs> <laughs> Rene, there goes. <laughs> well, I, I could use... Go ahead. Go ahead, Rene. sir. Go ahead, sir. 
No, 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 Rene, go ahead. No, I, I just want to say that the Jungian paradigm is really about um, psycho spirituality, but really more from the individual perspective. The ultimate goal really is individuation, which is getting to know ourselves better and better over time. So it's really, and it, so it's, um, I think, basically psychodynamic as well, which is making the unconscious more conscious, if you may. But you know, the self does not stand alone. The self is by its definition, the individual and the environment. So it really is uh, interconnectedness. Mm -hmm.